we are talking about the comparison of the Omega Speedmaster Professional versus the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona. It's one of the most important comparisons that pretty much every collector will have to ask themselves at some point, and so we're gonna be breaking it down today. We'll be comparing these two watches across five different categories, and that is the history of the watches and the brands that make them, their design, their versatility, their technical characteristics and their movements, and of course the value. And in this case, since both of them are production watches in current production, I'm talking about their retail value. So let's get right into it and starting with history. Well, Omega as a brand was founded in 1848. It was originally called Le General Watch Co. However, in 1903, they decided to rename it to Omega. And that was based on a movement that they were making at the time, which they called the Omega Movement, which was supposed to be the movement and all movements. Then moving on to the Speedmaster itself, well that was originally launched in 1957 and then key dates for that are 1962 in which it accompanied Wally Shira into space as the first Omega in space and then of course in 1969 when it beat out Rolex, Breitling, uh, Longines, Hamilton and several other watch brands as the watch of choice for NASA to accompany its astronauts to the moon. Since then, the Omega Speedmaster Professional has barely changed. It still uses the same movement architecture that's used for over 50 years with the caliber 1861 or 1863. And the only real dynamic change has been the quality of the bracelet and the fact that in this case, they've added a sapphire case back and sapphire crystal on the front so that you can view that movement. And in this case, it's the 1863 as they actually decorate it a little bit more because it's on display. As for Rolex and the Rolex Daytona, well in 1920 Montreal Rolex SA was founded by Hans Wilsdorf, however he had been making watches since 1905. The Rolex Daytona itself was actually originally called the Le Mans when it was released in 1963. However, they did eventually change the name to the Daytona, naming it after the 24 hours of Daytona race of which Rolex to this day is still a current sponsor. Since 1963, however, there have been eight different generations of Cosmograph Daytona and, most, and the most important advances were in 1988 when they released the 16520 with the Zenith El Primero movement. That was the first automatic Daytona and it also set the current design language. And then the year 2000, they introduced the in-house movement, the 4130 in the reference 116520 and then you have the current generation released in 2016 with the ceramic bezel, which is almost identical to its predecessor. And that is the reference 116500LN. Between these two, the historical significance of the Daytona is very important, especially with the sale of the Paul Newman, which held the record of the most expensive watch ever sold at auction. However, its historical contributions have been largely limited to big auctions. Now, it hasn't really done too much in terms of contributing to any other historical events. So the Speedmaster's Moonwatch heritage, being the first one on the moon, still being NASA's uh, watch of choice. So any sort of future historical events that happen, most likely an Omega will be on that astronaut's wrist. For those reasons, I have to give the win to the Omega. Moving on to design. Well, the design of the Omega Speedmaster has barely changed since 1969. The only real differences aren't even aesthetic. It's more functional in terms of they switched from tritium to luminova. It has a better bracelet. And yes, of course, now it has a sapphire case back that you can look and see that caliber 1863. However, the design is very much of the late 60s and early 70s. It's functional. It's very high contrast. It's classic. It has those twisted liar lugs that are Another hallmark of Omega as a brand, a lot of its iconic watches have those twisted lugs and it gives it a more organic feel to what's for all intents and purposes a tool watch. And then it also has that shield guard for the pushers and the crown, which does give it an asymmetrical look, but for some reason it just, it looks right and it gives it a bit more presence on the wrist as well. In terms of measurements, it's 42 millimeters, again unchanged since the original, and in the sapphire sandwich it is 13.9 millimeters thick, so it is a little bit thicker than the Rolex, I'll talk about that in a second, but those dimensions do give it nice proportions because it's a little bit taller, but it is also a little bit wider, so it does maintain a nice proportion on the wrist. Meanwhile, the Daytona, as with pretty much every Rolex, is an exercise in evolution over revolution. In this case, it's an evolution of the original design from 1988. 
the biggest change being of course the ceramic and the polished center links as well to give it a more luxurious feel. In terms of dimensions, it's still 40 millimeters. In terms of height, it is 12.5 millimeters. So it is a very sleek watch. It doesn't have the super case, so it is much more curvaceous than some of the other professional Rolexes. And that bezel does give it a fair bit of extra presence. So even though it's a 40 millimeter watch, the bezel does give it a little bit more extra presence on the wrist than you would expect by just looking at the numbers. And that's something that Rolex always does very well. They always master their proportions. So it's something that doesn't look too big, but not too small either. Between these two, I have to give the win to the Omega for the reason that this design hasn't even had to change since 1969. The fact that they managed to sustain the same design for 50 years shows how good a design it is, and it truly is. It's legible, it's elegant, it's functional. Whereas the Rolex, while yes, it has sustained essentially the same basic design for well over 30 years, they still have had to make little tweaks to sort of keep it with the times. And that demonstrates, in my opinion, that it is a bit less of a strong design if they had to change it a bit more versus one that sustained for 50 years. I don't think there was that much audacity in any of those tweaks, so I can't give it credit for that like I did in the case of the Tudor Black Bay. So for those reasons, I have to give the design win to the Omega Speedmaster as well. In terms of versatility, well, the Speedmaster with its classic design does mean it can do double duty as a dress watch. It's not too tall as far as chronographs go, but it will fight a few cuffs depending on how tight they are. And if you put it on a leather strap, it definitely does still look the part at least. However, it does also lend itself very well to a bunch of other straps. It comes with two NATO straps and, and a strap changing tool. And that already from the beginning, as soon as you get it in the box, starts to encourage you to explore its versatility, to explore it with different looks, whether it be NATO straps, whether it be leather straps, rubber, or even the bracelet. The bracelet itself is quite versatile in that it has those little touches of polish that aren't too ostentatious. They don't stand out as much as the polished center links on the Oyster bracelet. However, they do add a little bit of dressiness and class to the bracelet if you are trying to wear the Speedmaster on the bracelet. However, the downside to the versatility of the Omega Speedmaster is that it only has 50 meters of water resistance. That's not enough for you to use it with confidence in terms of if you're going swimming, in my opinion, or even if you're just going to the beach. I feel like 50 meters of water resistance isn't enough to give you the confidence that nothing's gonna happen to it, so that may limit how much you can use it. On the flip side, the Rolex Daytona has 100 meters of water resistance and that's secured with a trip lock crown as well for extra security. It is also a little bit thinner than the Speedmaster. Measuring 12.5 millimeters thick, it'll easily slide under most dress cuffs and its iconic status as a symbol of success mean that it'll be much more appropriate if you're wearing it in a business scenario because obviously it's a clear sign that you're doing well, you're someone to be taken seriously. It'll fit under a business suit cuff and a shirt cuff in most cases. And even as a dress watch, if you put it on a leather strap, then it definitely does dress up the watch quite a fair bit more, even though people seem to be a bit more resistant to putting Rolexes on straps, especially the modern ones. But it definitely does look the part, so it is even more capable as a dress watch. And then in terms of versatility as a sports watch, as I said, with that 100 meter water resistance, you can go swimming with a lot more confidence in it. It has the screwed on crown and the screwed on pushers, so there's a lot less chance that water's gonna get in there unless you do some serious diving. And then last but not least, it has the easy link, which adds about five millimeters of length to the bracelet should your wrist expand or contract with temperature. And that just gives you more reasons to wear it. So for those reasons, I have to give the victory of versatility to the Rolex Daytona. In terms of movement and functions, well, the Omega Speedmaster has the caliber 1863, which is essentially the same caliber it's been using for over 50 years, and its age does show. It's a manual wind, lateral clutch cam system chronograph with 48 hours of power reserve and three registers, and that's about it. By contrast, the Rolex 4130 is an extremely advanced movement. It was released in the year 2000, and it set the tone essentially for all current uh, modern chronographs. It has a column wheel and a vertical clutch. It has a 70 hour power reserve. It has the Parachrome hairspring. It's chronometer certified and it's a superlative chronometer. So without a doubt, there's no argument whatsoever that the Daytona wins from a technical perspective. And that's before you even consider its anti-corrosive oyster steel, the ceramic, which is nearly impervious to scratches, that 100 meter water resistance that I mentioned, the trip lock crown, the amount of technical developments that go into the Rolex Daytona, without a doubt, eclipse the Omega Speedmaster, and for that reason, I have to give it that victory.
Moving on to value, as I mentioned, because these are both current production watches, their value judgment is gonna be based on their retail price. So the Omega Speedmaster costs around 6,350 US dollars in the Sapphire Sandwich configuration. For that, you get the see-through case back, you get the additional decoration on the movement as well, you get everything I mentioned in terms of design, history, and heritage, as well as a five-year warranty on a movement that's been in active service for over 50 years, so that's a testament to its reliability. But you also get the box, which in itself is a lot of spectacle and theater and makes it a very special purchase experience. And on the inside, you have a strap changing tool, you have two accessory straps, you have the Speedmaster Paperweight, which features the Hippocampus, which is a homage to the fact that the Speedmaster was originally part of the Seamaster line. It all adds just for making a special experience. And at 6,350 US, it is relatively good value. There are some watches that are cheaper, some that are more expensive and more advanced, but none of them can beat it for specialness and nostalgia. Meanwhile, the Rolex Daytona, well, yes, in the box you do get a very competent watch and that's about it. The main specialness of buying your Daytona is the fact that you were actually able to get one at retail. So if we tally up the scores, well, the Omega won in three categories, that was history, design, and value. Meanwhile, the Rolex did blow the Omega out of the park from a technical perspective, as well as winning in terms of versatility. But the numbers are what they are, and in this case, the Omega has won with three categories versus the Rolexes two. But let me know in the comments below what you think. Which of these two do you prefer and why? And also let me know which of these two would you put your own money in because it's a very different case when you're making opinions on them. It's another when you're actually putting your money where your mouth is. And if you choose the Daytona, how much of your own money would you actually be willing to put into this watch?